Well, hello, and welcome once again to an episode of Unstoppable Mindset. Today, we get to have a chat with Kelly Thompson. Now, Kelly lived and lives in Canada. She was in the military for a while and had to retire with an injury, and I'm sure she'll want to talk about that and tell us about that. But her main love really is writing and doing all things with writing and book things and so on. She's written some books, and I'm sure we're going to hear about that as we go forward. And I don't want to give any more away because that wouldn't be any fun. Then why would we have her on the podcast? So Kelly, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Well, we're really glad that you're here. And why don't we start, like I really love to do, with people, um, and and I'll ask you to do the same thing. Tell us kind of about the early Kelly, growing up and all that stuff. Early Kelly was so different from current Kelly. Very painfully, chronically shy. Um, Hid behind my mom. Didn't want to make eye contact. Um, I attribute this in part to the bowl cut I was forced to have when I was a kid. But that aside, I also just (laughs) didn't. I just was really... Uh, I lacked confidence and I was really, really shy, always wanted to be a writer. And so I think when I did join uh, the military, once I was in high school, it really blew a lot of minds. People didn't see this happening for me because at this point I was very artistic and I'm very girly and I really loved lipstick and nail polish. And then signing up for the military, I definitely got a couple raised eyebrows from folks. Wow. What yeah. made you decide to join the military? Because that, that certainly, especially for a shy person, but, you know, in general and in high school, what made you decide to go that route? Uh, 9-11 happened, right? Mm. My final year of high school. And um, in Canada, in Ontario, I was the last year to do uh, grade 13, they call it. So it was the year you had to do to graduate to go to university instead of to just graduate with your high school diploma. And uh, my dad was in the military. I'm the fourth generation on both sides of my family. And, um, and and I wanted an education and it felt like a way to pay for it in a world where accessing education is so um, steep in terms of its cost. And um, so I signed up. I wanted to work in casualty administration. So I really wanted to help people when they were injured and when they were ill. It felt like a place where... I could contribute something of value where my empathy would be a a strong point. I've heard of grade 13 before. Tell me a little bit more about that. How does that work? Well, it doesn't work anymore because I was the Uh, last year to do it. So this would was it actually an extra grade? So you went to okay. Anyway, yeah, it was a whole extra year, and um, you you could do grade twelve in order to graduate from high school, and then you could go to college or you could go, you know, to a vocational program. But if you wanted to go to university, you had to um, you had to do they called it OAC. You had to do OAC. It was the final year, but I actually skipped grade. 12. So I did one course that I had to do for grade 12 and skipped the rest of the year. So I could graduate a year early because I was very stressed about graduating with, um, they called it the double cohort, because of course, then you suddenly had two years of students graduating at the same time. Right. Uh, And I was panicked about getting into university. So uh, I really busted my butt those last two years of high school. But you went into the military or did you go to college? I did. You went to the uh, I military did the, first. I did the ROTP program. So I went to um, university during the school year and every summer I did all my training. Wow. So yeah. why did why did you want to do that really? And I mean, I have no problem with the concept of the military, but it's just fascinating to hear someone who clearly had that goal in mind for quite a while in high school. Yeah. I I still admittedly don't know. I I think it was the first time, you know, any of us who remember those that monumental change in our world. Mm-hmm. It's suddenly a recognition of your place within it. And I think at that age, you know, I was just 17 at the time, it was suddenly this maybe I want to do something for someone that's other than myself, which, you know, when you're a teenager, you're not very well versed in thinking about anyone other than yourself. So I don't, I still don't really know. Um, 
I think for military kids, like army brats, you know, growing up in that life, there's a weird comfort in the discomfort. There's a knowledge Mm. that, um, you know, things are always changing, which can be both really wonderful and really frightening at the same time. As someone who always had really chronic anxiety, sometimes it's good for me to put myself in a situation in which I'm forced to confront that anxiety instead of giving into it all the time as well. So it ended up being a really beautiful thing for me in a lot of different ways and a really complicated thing in a lot of ways as well. It's interesting, though, that you put yourself in a position to force yourself to confront it. Um, I love the way you say that, and it's not something that necessarily all that many people are really willing to do to take the chance and step out of your comfort zone like that all on your own. Taking the leap is hard. You know, I remember even showing up at basic training and, uh, and I mean, I sobbed hysterically. (laughs) I'm not going to lie to you. I was (laughs) terrified. Um, but it was the first time I was really stepping into myself as a person. Um, and, and, the military really taught me what I was made of. And sometimes you don't really know that until you reach some sort of adversity in some way or another. Or as I said, you're forced to have a moment of confronting what it means to serve something other than yourself. But it sounds like along the way, as you were going into the military and doing the things that you did, you obviously thought about it, you processed it. And I don't know whether you questioned yourself, why did I go into this? But you you clearly thought about it because you recognized what it was doing to you. And again, um, I don't know that everyone necessarily does that. Yeah. And and I think, again, that's part of, like I said, the, the process of really learning who you are. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly all these things that I thought I couldn't do, like if you had told me I would have been carrying the weight I was carrying or you know, walking with broken legs or putting up mentally with a lot of the stuff that was happening around the time, I would have said, of course not. I could never. And I don't say I can never do anything anymore. It's just removed from my vocabulary. Which is really important and really probably a good thing because we often amaze ourselves as to how much we really can do, which is why in part we do this podcast, because as I tell people, Unstoppable Mindset is all about showing people who listen that they can be more unstoppable than they think they can. 100%. So what was it like for you in the military or how much of that do you want to talk about? (laughs) Oh, Michael. Oh, Michael. There goes a couple of three hours. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I, it's very hard to be, I mean, I am not the strongest, physically strongest person on the planet. So it's very hard to be in an environment where every value is placed on your physicality. Mm. And what was funny was when it came to doing, you know, in basic training, especially when it came to doing things that were about leadership. And um, I'll also say I really kicked butt on the range. I was pretty good there. But, you know, we did, we would do these taskings where you had, it was all about how you lead, led your troops and how you formulated a plan. And I kicked butt there. And yet, Um, I was really looked down upon because I was seen as physically weak. But at the same time, you know, in basic training, and we were right near the end of the course, and we're in the field, and it's like a a horrible grueling week, and you're carrying all the rucksack and everything. And I broke my leg. And I was saying, look, you know, my leg, I in the book, I say it looks like my knee swallowed a basketball. It was just gigantic. And no, they told me I had tendonitis. They gave me some Tylenol, literally four Tylenol, and told me to keep going. And so I did. And it's a it's a decision that both haunts me because I'm I now have a permanent disability from that. And it lost me my career. That if I had stepped back and said, no, I want to have an X-ray, I want someone to X-ray this, um, it might have had a different outcome for me. Mm -hmm. So I would have marched another 25 miles on that leg broken. I did a week of drill practice. And then six weeks later, back at university, they said, you know, your pain's not matching tendonitis. This can't be. So they finally sent me for an MRI and the broken bone has never healed properly because it was so damaged. Mm. So I squeaked out about eight years of military service before I got medically released. They tried everything. I had 
nerve burning procedures. I had my own bone marrow sucked from my hip and spun for stem cells and injected into my knee. I did that three times. I had several surgeries and it just isn't better. And so sometimes I thought for all the weakness they thought I had, it pushed me into a scenario where I felt like I had to prove how tough I was. And while, yes, I learned what I was made of, and I did learn I was tough, I knew that mentally before I needed to break physically to tell me that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you discovered how mentally tough you were. And I understand yeah. the whole concept of physicality in the Army and with basic training, especially, and so on. But there's more to life than just being the strongest person physically, um, mm -hmm. as you clearly learned. 100%. And I had hoped, you know, I had these lingering dreams that like, once I start my actual job in the military, I'm going to show them, you know, I'm going to show them how good I am at my job. Um, I, when I finally did all my training for my actual career in the forces as a logistics officer, I was the top student on the course out of 102 students. I worked really hard, um, but the sexual harassment was so constant and pervasive to the point that I constantly felt reduced to my chest size and my body instead mm. of, um, and it was just another form of my physicality being, being what was valued about me instead of my brain and my ability to do my job well. And officers and leaders wouldn't really address the issues. Well, and I was an officer and this is what was, you know, what was bananas about it was I was a sexual harassment advisor. So I had all this special training and I would give these lectures about sexual harassment and be harassed while I was doing it. And it's this weird power structure within the forces where when it's my boss who's harassing me, what am I supposed to do? Where yeah. do I go? And especially when I would work with women whose rapists were deployed with them overseas and and I thought we're not protecting people at home. How are these people also supposed to protect people on the other side of the country? It was or other side of the world rather. It was really demoralizing, and I lost my love for the organization that had been my home my whole life. Um, even though I met my husband, so that turned out okay. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a start. <laughs> he did carry me when I broke my leg. We met in basic training and he carried me when I broke my leg for three kilometers. So about two miles. Um, and that's a, that's a guy you marry, Michael. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Nice to have uh, the, the reasons in perspective. Well, <laughs> and I think too, I think sometimes people think that perhaps I'm, against the military, which of course I'm not. My husband still mm -hmm. serves. Um, I can't be a veteran and a daughter of a veteran and my husband's still serving and not really think at the end of the day, we signed up because we wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And I still believe in the goodness of those people. I just think it's an organization that really needs work to be better. And what's beautiful is since my book came out, I get to be a part of making it better. Uh, I get invited to speak all over to different bases and give lectures and writing workshops. So finally, I'm using my skills and training to bring to the table to make um, to make that space better and safer for other people. And I love it. Do you think that you're seeing improvements? Is it is it getting better? Because I know that in the military, it's been such a closed loop and a closed place for so long. But, you know, even now down here, we're hearing about how we need to be a little bit more sensitive to other kinds of needs. And, of course, there's all the discussions about LGBTQ and other things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but are we and at the same time, I do appreciate and understand that we are looking for certain things from most people in the military. We do want people who are physically tough because they're going to be in physically challenging places. But is there room to look at alternative uh, qualifications or requirements or criteria for dealing with some people who are not necessarily going to be out in the field 
or jumping out of aircraft and so on. Well, and it's funny because that was the kind of job I had. I had very much a desk job and I 100% support the idea that every soldier needs to be able to be a soldier. You know, Mm -hmm. that's what we sign up for. That's the job. Um, But I also think there's a time and place for certain kinds of concessions. Um, And of course, our militaries operate a little bit differently as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, thinking about we can't have a system in place that makes people fearful of coming forward when they're in pain, whether that's physical or mental. I'm definitely seeing a lot of positive change. You know, I look at when I was still serving, so this was sort of 2010, I was writing for a big Canadian magazine and I was writing a little blog about women and uh, what it was like being a woman in the military, things about the uniform and, um, you know, light frothy subjects. And I got hauled in off leave, even though I had permission to do it. Um, Our secret service created a file on me. I got hauled in to have this big discussion and sign a memo that I was accepting all responsibility. And my boss said at the time, do you, is it really this important to you to speak out about nothing? And I thought, you know, like, this is just having a little voice and that matters to people. You know, anyone who's in a marginalized community, having a bit of voice matters and it feels good. And so I kept going with that. And then I look at the negative reaction, but then when my book came out 10 years later, the beautiful reaction of in asking me to come speak, come join the mil, like come to these military events and talk to us about how we can improve. If that's not change in yeah. 10 years, I don't know what is. It's interesting, though, that your boss started the conversation, albeit 10 years earlier. Is it really that important to you to talk about nothing? Mm. Mm-hmm. And I, um, yeah. And it just comes to whose stories do we value? You right. know, not all, not all military stories are war stories, just like not all workplace stories involve a computer. You know, it's just, um, it was just a different perspective. And at the same time, I was getting lovely emails from women in the military saying, hey, this is the first time I've seen a story about us. And it's nice to be seen in the world. So how long have you guys been married now? Oh, uh, tw- 12 years now. Wow. And so I still looks, like him, Michael. It looks like it might last for a while. Well, and I've <laughs> known him for 20. So that's that's saying a lot. I, I still like him. I still love him. He's still that guy who would carry me with my rucksack at the same time. Although I was thinner then, so it was probably a little bit easier than it would be now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> there is always that. So does so do you guys move around or does he move around a lot or we move you, every two years. Every two years. Like clockwork. Um, we've been all over Canada, one side to the other. Right now we're in we we've been in Colorado Springs for two weeks. So we're here for two years. Um he can retire in four and a half or five. So we'll see where we go from there. But um this is you know, I remember he deployed for a year um, a couple of years ago, and a year is a long time to be away from your partner. Yeah. And he said, and I remember being, you know, all grumpy about it. And he said, you have to remember, this is what we signed up for. Yeah. We knew some that this, and and it is, this is what we sign up for. So sometimes I've learned since leaving the forces that I'm still involved in a million different ways, and it gets to be under my own my way that suits me and brings me joy and um, what a gift that is. And the very fact that you analyze and think about that and come up with that is I think really important and relevant. Um, Doing your own self analysis is always an important thing and a helpful thing to do. 100%. I bring that from therapy, Michael. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) So tell me, um, what do you think about Colorado so far? So you've been there two weeks. That It must be different than Canada. Well, there was a shooting my first night here, which is definitely seeing people carry weapons is, is unreal to me. This is yeah. not something you would ever see in Canada. Um, but gosh, it's beautiful here. The people why, are why so is that, nice. Though? Well, why is that that you don't see it in Canada, but we see it more and more here in the U.S.? Uh, I think it's just a different different gun control, different gun laws. Um, 
accessing a weapon in Canada is, is pretty difficult um, in terms of purchasing one. And um, to be honest, I wouldn't even know where to begin, which is as someone who knows how to operate a weapon, I, I yeah. still wouldn't really know where to begin. Um, so it's it's a lot trickier to access there. And um, and yet you guys don't seem to be dying or have uh, any more and maybe less weird people than uh, we encounter here or in other places. Oh, I'm sure we have many weird. I've met yeah. many of them, but we definitely don't have um, the weapons problem right. in the same way. And I think it's just um, gun control. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how that's flying with your audience, but also it's it's also just a you know a different mentality. I'm I'm cognizant of a, a of just a different mentality and people wanting to assert their their rights. I heard one person from Congress, I think it was last week, say something like, and it's an interesting concept. We need to get away from talking about gun control and maybe talk about it in terms of gun responsibility. I mean, I just, I can't imagine, I, I saw, I, I, on the drive out here, so just a couple of weeks ago, there was a man who was very upset that he couldn't bring his weapon into the bookstore. And it's like, you probably don't need it in the bookstore, you know? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, You're going to shoot a book? Imagine. I mean, truly, I, I have hated many a book, but I don't know if I feel a need to be violent with it. Yeah. Um, so that has been a change, but the... The people are lovely and welcoming. Uh, I mean, you cannot beat the view yeah. of, of these mountains. And, you know, tonight we're going on an art walk and our neighbors are wonderful and have invited us over for barbecues. I mean, it's just been, um, there's not much to not like here in Colorado so far. Yeah, it's a great state. Although my skin is so dry, Michael, I'm going to be broke for body <laughs> cream. Broke. <laughs> go, to, go to Costco. Yeah, load me up with the big tubs. Yeah, <laughs> but definitely it's uh, there's so much, and you know I like I like Canada as well, and I've spent not a huge amount of time that I spent a number of times both in speaking and then earlier in selling, and you know for me I think that there's beauty everywhere in the world, and it's a matter of looking for it and and Absolutely. realizing it, and I just I think around the United States. Um, I haven't found a place that I wouldn't want to be, although I do uh, question some places that emphasize fried food so much. But, you know, <laughs> that happens. I, You know, even driving through Kansas, and I've heard a lot of people say bad things about Kansas, and I thought, but can you beat the beauty of just seeing forever? Like, yeah. there's just some, you know, and this is the part about moving every two years. We have lived in deserts we've lived in rainforests we have lived in a place where there was snow nine months of the year and it was well over your head and there's just you're right there's beauty everywhere and if you're going to be someone who walks into it negative and go oh well this isn't like home then you're going to be awfully grumpy and negative the whole time you might as well enjoy it yeah well it isn't like home hello yeah. it's easy enough to figure out and so um it's so what <laughs> and how wonderful is that you know yeah who yeah. You get to, you get to experience new things. Well, when you did retire from the military, what did you go off and do? I immediately decided I was living in Ontario at the time, close to Toronto, and decided to move out to Vancouver um, to work in publishing. And then I had a major health crisis. I um, I discovered I had a bad thyroid disease and needed to have my thyroid killed with mm. radiation. Oh. Um, so I was off work a long time. I was quite ill. I, I lost 30 pounds. My nails fell out. My hair fell out. Um, wasn't a good time. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe this is it. So I had an undergraduate degree in professional writing. And I thought, maybe this is it. I'll get my master's degree in creative writing. I'll finally, do I always wanted to write books. Maybe this is what I'll do. So going from being in the military to doing a fine arts degree was perhaps the largest culture shock of my life. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, I would, I was talking to this one woman and she was, she was having a hard time with this story she was working on. And she said, Oh, it's so hard. It's like basic training. And I went, no, 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 it's not. It's not. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not. Um, 
<laughs> really, really big culture shock. Yeah. And so I did that at the University of British Columbia. And at the same time, I had the time of my life. I learned to be more comfortable expressing myself again, to have fun and play a little, which the military doesn't leave a ton of room for that, <laughs> understandably. Um, and that's how I came up with Girls Need Not Apply and wrote my first book and was really lucky to get an agent. Um, and the, it's been a ride and how lucky I've been. And so when you moved out to British Columbia, you weren't married yet. No, no. And Joe was out on the island. And finally, we got together and uh, we decided to keep each other. So well, now I, um, you know, we could never be together because we were in the military and we lived across the country from one another. So when I was. So he was in out, the West. He was in the West. Yeah. Uh, Joe's an air traffic controller. And so he was on an Air Force base. And now I have a job where I get to follow him all the time without being angry because I lose my job. <laughs> so it's been, a, it's kind of a dream. And I um, decided to go on and do a PhD as well in creative writing. So now I, I teach at Canada's only creative nonfiction master's degree program. Um, it's always been online. So I, again, get to keep my job and Professionally, life is feeling pretty dream boaty. <laughs> well, you know, and it's all a question of how you look at it. Um, we we exactly. all deal with changes. You mentioned September 11th, and I remember, um, I remember the day, of course, in a very vivid way, having been there. But I also, I think, was raised recognizing that I'm going to face a lot of changes and surprises in my life. You know, walking across the street for me can be more of a surprise than for you because mm -hmm. you may see the lights of a car coming at you and make a decision. And I may or may not hear that car. Um, or um, I hear a car coming uh, from a side street and I'm expecting it to stop. And then suddenly, even though I know I have the, the right of way in the traffic, the car decides not to, and I have to deal with that. And so I've learned a lot about surprises and learned a lot about reacting to different things. And maybe that helped me on September 11th, because mm. when it happened, I also knew what to do because I had learned what to do. I, I had established a mindset because of the knowledge I gained about what to do in an emergency in the World Trade Center that it helped. But it still is... Um, a, a challenge, I think, for me to understand why so many people can't deal with change, whether it's the World Trade Center or so many things. And like even with the pandemic, we've had so many people yelling about masks and locking down and 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 mm -hmm. a lot of political shots, right? Well, Dr. Fauci Very didn't much. say initially that we needed to have masks and all the change his mind. What's the problem? The guy doesn't know what he's doing. Well, you had a president who specifically heard about it before Fauci and never passed it on. So, you know, come on. But it's a matter of what information you have and what you learn to do with it. But we're, we don't learn to analyze very well, it seems to me, or we don't learn that that change is okay. We say it is, but we hate it when it happens. Absolutely. And, you know, when I said that I joined partly – in the forces, I was constantly forced into change. You know, you're always moving. One day you, you're you living on one base and the next they tell you, oh, you're going here for four months and you're away from home and you have no control. And I think the older I get, you know, I'm as I approach 40, I, I have more acceptance of the things that are out of my control, but it's also been, uh, I, I don't know if you're, a Brene Brown reader, Michael, but uh, she talks about how everyone's just doing their best. Mm -hmm. And when I look at it like that, I have a different attitude to either people who hurt me or people who uh, make choices that hurt others. We're all just trying to do our best and get by. Um, but I do think if we had more talks about not expecting everything to be rosy all the time, we might adapt a wee bit better. I'm not sure that I would totally buy into we are always doing our best, but I think that we're always trying, but it doesn't matter whether somebody else is really doing all that they can to do their best or not. 
it still doesn't give us the right to judge. That's true. Yes. Well put. And so from that standpoint, it's probably a good perspective that everyone is just trying to do their best. Mm-hmm. We're at least, at least we're trying something. <laughs> we're trying something. And that's always a, that's always a good thing. So you wrote Girls Need Not Apply. That's right. And um, so how long ago was that? That came out in 2019. Ah. Um, just, and it was a hard time for me because uh, it was the year after my sister died. Mm. And it had been a really difficult uh, two-year time frame because my husband was deployed for that year. Uh, my sister was diagnosed the day after giving birth and died a year later. And from so from cancer. cancer. Uh-huh. Yes. And she had been an addict for a long time. So we had a we had had a complicated relationship, except for the previous couple of years that she'd been sober. And she never got to see that dream actualized. So I I had a on top of missing her, it it made the book celebration, this dream of my entire life, uh, a little stifled without her there. Mm. So I wrote about it. <laughs> Well, there you go. So another thing to write about, needless to say. <laughs> yeah. So the, actually that book just came out, uh, Still I Cannot Save You, came out um, in February this year. And so this is my first book in the U.S., actually. Um, Girls Need Not Apply was only available in Canada. And so it came out in February. It's been wonderful, the response from folks. Um, other people, it, it's talking about sisterhood. It's talking about loving someone who's wounded you in a couple different ways. Um, but it's also really looking at mental health. I talk a lot about suicidality in that book and feeling almost guilty for having those feelings when my sister is dying and who am I to, to be depressed. And it's funny how we kind of internalize our own ableism half the time, you know, not realizing that, well, it's an illness. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with an illness. And so, um, yeah, it was a complicated, difficult book to write. I'll bet. Um, yeah. But working through it is is part of what probably is is very refreshing. Well, refreshing probably is the not the best word, but but cathartic for you and helps you be able to move on because you are able to talk about it. And learning to do that by writing it is always a good thing. Absolutely. And it's why I love teaching so much because they, they, my boss jokingly calls me sort of the trauma room. Everyone who has a really complicated (laughs) book ends up getting, being my student in terms of complicated emotions. You know, some people are writing books that are sort of more research-based or biography or uh, uh, yeah, biography-based. And um, it, it's a real honor to sit with other people's stories when we think about it. It's a way to really, uh, I mean, you know, from writing your, your book, um, there's something wonderful about taking a little piece of your pain and hoping that in the hands of someone else, they find a small part of their own healing or maybe, you know, a prompt to talk to other people or at the very least a sense of being with other people who understand them. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Or trying to, and sometimes yeah. it's it's a completely different environment, and and we don't always learn. But hopefully, when we read something that's different from what we're used to, and we think about it, we'll learn from it, which is always a good thing. One hundred percent, and I and I believe that's also why I ended up taking this whole area of study into a PhD. So I would I was particularly examining how we use writing and to cope with grief and cope with loss and pain and to take it, you know, I never thought this would be a way I would take it in terms of getting a PhD. It wasn't something that necessarily interested me, but I started getting really into the different forms that people have used over the years. You know, when you think about, I remember when my sister died, there's a, a part in the book where I write about, feeling like I wanted a sandwich board, like one of those outfits that people wear to advertise things that would just say, I'm grieving. You know, if I'm crying randomly in the grocery aisle, it's because I'm grieving. And when you think about it, we used to wear, you know, we used to wear morning clothes. We wore black clothing to announce that we were sad. 
sometimes I think some of those those old traditions might have helped me a little bit yeah. um, in a in a couple different ways. So, well, I know I I think about a lot how I reacted to September 11th and mm-hmm. all that happened. And then how I react to my wife of 40 years passing last November. And both for me were very personal, but Karen's passing certainly in a, in a lot of ways is a lot more personal and there's more grief. But I remember go working through and going through what happened on September 11th. And so I also worked to try to get to the same place mentally with Karen's passing that I do with then that I did with the world trade center, because Mm. they were both challenging times, but ultimately um, Karen wouldn't want me to sit and mope and not continue to move forward. As I tell people, I'm not going to move on from Karen because that would Mm. mean I would leave her and, and forget her. And I won't do that. I will move forward. But as I tell people, the spirit in her case moved faster than the body. And that was a problem, but she's out there. And I know that if I misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. So (laughs) I'm, I choose to keep that idea. And, and so I'm sure that that will happen. If I ever misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. Do you think you'll write about Karen, Michael? Um, I'm, I, well, well, yes, actually. Yes. Um, mm. working on a third book because our second book, Running with Roselle, came out in 2014. It was meant more for kids, and <clears throat> it was um, a word book rather than a picture book. It was more about me growing up and Roselle growing up, the guide dog in the World Trade Center, and how we met mm-hmm. and all that. So there's not nearly at all as much about September 11th in it, and more adults buy it than kids, as I've learned over the years. Really. Oh yeah, it's more fun. But um, <laughs> during the pandemic, I realized that in fact, um, I was not afraid at the World Trade Center, and I realized why over the years. But I never did anything about it to teach others how to to deal with fear. Mm-hmm. And so we're writing a a new book. We've got a publisher for it here in the U.S. And we're working through it now and, uh, and exciting going through all the edits. And there will be a fair amount in there about Karen um, because she had a, an illness in 2014 where she had double pneumonia as well mm. as acute respiratory distress syndrome was in the ICU for a month and, uh, and was yeah. able to, to come out of that. But then what happened this past November? So, yep, she's a major part of the book in a lot of ways. I'm glad to hear it, and I can't wait to read it. Well, we'll keep you posted. Well, and when you think about it, as a world, we're we're going through such a collective state of grief right now. You know, the last couple of years have robbed us of loved ones on top of experiences and and. And even the ability to grieve, considering how some people had to say goodbye as well. And I think the more story, you know, sometimes I remember my parents saying, well, why do you want to wallow in this and sit with it? And I said, oh, I'm here anyways. You know, to to assume that I am not thinking of her constantly is yeah. is a disservice. I might as well yes. make, make something beautiful of it. Mm-hmm. And I think your beauty will come too from sharing your story and and when other people find a nugget of comfort there. One of the things that I tell people is ironically, uh, I put myself in a situation where I would have to talk about September 11th. And that is Mm. because afterward, when the media got my story and people started asking for interviews, Karen and I talked about what we should do. And I said, if I can help people move on from September 11th and learn about blindness and blind people, learn about guide dogs and so on, then it was worth doing. And literally we had over a six month period or so, <clears throat> seven month period, hundreds of interviews. And the other part about that is there were, there were some newspaper, but a lot of TV and radio and a lot of people came to our homes. And I love to tell people how it was fascinating to see all the different styles and processes that people went through to do interviews. For example, an Italian film crew <laughs> came 
and they had 14 people crowded into our living room, a few of whom just sat around and were directing everybody else and not doing anything except doing a lot of talking. (laughs) And then we had um, three people from New Zealand, um, a couple of times, two people from a Japanese station. And you contrast the two, 14 people from Italy, and it's just amazing how, how different groups worked. I'm assuming they all came out okay and everyone was happy with it, but it was certainly just so funny to see all of that. And then people started calling and saying, would you come and talk with us and tell us what we should learn? And so I have been doing that ever since because I have decided selling philosophy and selling life is a whole lot more fun than selling computer hardware. (laughs) I bet it is. And it is. It's a lot more fun. The pandemic slowed things down, but we're working on picking up again. And so that'll be okay. Well, but, I watched some of your beautiful lectures. Um, so what a gift you are when you do travel to those things. Well, always looking for it. So anybody who's out there who <laughs> knows of any places to uh, hire a speaker, we'd love to hear from you. And, uh, and you know, just email me, Michael at MichaelHI at accessibility.com. There, we got that plug in. But, <laughs> but the reality is that I think that I grew a lot by allowing myself to go through those interviews because I did what we all really need to do in one way or another, and that's to talk about our feelings. And I got asked really weird questions, but a lot of good, very complex, thought-provoking questions. So I have no complaints about the choices I made. You know, I, it was something in my study that I realized even in the books I was reading the exact moment that the person died, for example, was often skipped over in the book. And I'd think, well, wait, we were leading up to this huge moment. We don't have to turn away all the time from the things that hurt us. And there can be a lot of um, reflection that comes from leaning into those moments a little bit. Right. Yeah. And we we shouldn't skip it. We don't need to be graphic and gory and all that stuff all the sure. time either. Some of my favorite detective and mystery stories um, are, frankly, not the violent ones. Um, Yeah, I understand there are murders and all that. Well, my favorite detective outside Sherlock Holmes is Nero Wolfe and reading all the Rex Stout books and so on. You don't see people getting killed and reading all the graphic stuff, and you don't need to. We should use our minds more and create our own imaginations. But I love the books because they're puzzles. Um, and I will admit, so there's a guy whose his name is Robert Goldsboro, who has taken over writing the, the Nero Wolf books after Rex Stout passed. And I have to admit that I have been able to figure out in advance of the end of the book, a few of the, the bad guys in his books. I never was able to do that <laughs> with Rex Stout. Um, I, I hate to say it, but I was always good at doing that with Mary Higgins Clark, but uh, that's okay. So they were fun to read. And this is I the thing puzzles. too. And I, I love nothing more than a good thriller. And I love to be, I, I read everything. I read a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. I read poetry. I read self-help. I read research books. I read memoir, I, l- fiction, literary fiction, beach reads, you name it. I want to read it. And uh-huh. I am surrounded by books both on my phone, on my reader, on my computer, in my office. And I'm never happier than when I'm immersed in someone else's story. Because I think we're we're storytelling animals. It's how we connect with one another. Um, it's where, you know, looking at your giving your speeches, it's where we we find hope. It's where we find community. I have a book box at the end of my driveway, actually. <gasps> a, a free, a free little library. And I set it up everywhere I move and I stuff it full of books and people learn pretty (laughs) quick. I got the goods out there, Michael. I got brand new stuff that I put out right away. And I will say normally it takes people about six to eight weeks of it being out before anyone will take anything. They kind of need to like circle it a little bit and (laughs) look at it from afar. Is she really doing what she says she is? Yeah. In In Colorado. Colorado. I have already had to refill it and it's only been out for nine days. And I think that's the most magical, wonderful thing. 
Do um, people bring books back after they read them? Yes. Uh-huh. They bring them back. They bring new ones. They Little kids love going to it too. And I have a chalkboard on it so that kids can write to me. But, um, you know, sometimes they'll write that they want more of a certain thing. So then I keep an eye out on book sales or that kind of thing. And it is the most wonderful way of community building that I can find because there's just nothing better than slipping into a book. I love fiction because I think there more than anyone else or anywhere else, people really are forced to use their imaginations to create the books um, because they're really stretching their minds to get some of the plots that they get. Um, Although at the same time, when you're reading things like memoirs and so on, it's amazing what people have gone through that you never thought would happen. I mean, like even September 11th, who would have thought? But somebody so. did it. But still, the um, the imagination of writers in, in fiction and everywhere, but the imagination, especially in fiction, I think is just so incredible. And I am always so amazed when I read a book. Um, and on airplanes, I read fiction because I don't want to concentrate too hard. But I'm amazed <laughs> at this, the, the kinds of plots and the kinds of things that people have come up with. I And this is that my next book is is fiction, actually, and it's a thriller. And I am completely paralyzed by choice. It's like suddenly, what do you mean anything can happen? I, I, I find it, I am like you also worshiping all the fiction authors. How do they do it? And also like you, when I fly or when I'm driving and I'm listening to a, a audiobook, I really like, I want something that's, that's got a fun, fast yeah. plot that's going to keep yeah. my attention. Yeah. Yeah. Although I remember when I we were working on running with Roselle, I spent a flight across the country editing the book. Oh, um, goodness. That's about the only time I really worked at a book for a whole long flight, but it was fun. And um, I, I knew what I wanted to do with it. So it was okay. But still, I love to read light things, relatively speaking, on airplanes, because I don't have to concentrate as hard. And I also don't mind concentrating as hard. I just want to be able to do it where I can truly concentrate. In your own space. Yeah, yeah I get that. Which is which is cool. Well, you spent time in the military, you came out of the military, and you've been going around doing this and that and the other stuff. What did you learn? What lessons did the military really ta- teach you that you have taken beyond military life? Uh, I always say tenacity because military life, you have to just keep going. And then alternatively in writing life, it's so full of rejection and we're just here by ourselves in our own little world, slinging it out, hoping people buy it. Um, And it's a very lonely job. And so I have learned that there's nothing that will, if I want to do it, I will find a way to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I've also learned the military gave me some excellent organizational skills, which I have learned in the arts world is not common. (laughs) (laughs) So it may, it gives me a bit of a, a bit of a shine because I'm very organized. um, And I carry that with me. It, I always say it taught me what I was really made of and how how willing I am to give parts of myself if I feel it's going to be for something bigger. Um, and it really built my, my sense of community. You know, the beautiful thing about the military is that it is a family and Mm -hmm. that continues on even when you're gone. So I, I'm so much more active in my community now because I felt, you know, when I was in the military, I, I traveled a lot and I was away from home a lot. Whereas now I'm I work from home so I have a I volunteer a lot and give back a lot of my time and I um in teaching I always feel like I thought leaving the military would mean I was leaving that sense of home and instead I've learned home is where I'm going to make it and I can find home in a lot of different places not just physically but um in the communities that I surround myself with so yeah yeah do you still keep in touch with people from the military and have a lot of contact? Well, I've got the one I'm married, so definitely. Well, there's that yes, guy. There. Yeah. There's that guy. You made that uh, commitment. <laughs> 
I talk to him once in a while when I feel like it, <laughs> but I also, I definitely have a, cu- a couple of really good friends that I've kept in touch with because I'm often lecturing with the military. I've actually mm. made a lot of new friends as well, which is within the forces, which has been really wonderful. Um, and it's fun here because we're meeting people who are in the American military and talking to them. And we talk about how it's different and how it's the same. And there's still that sense of camaraderie. Mm-hmm. So I have about, about seven or eight really good friends who I still talk to uh, from the, from the military, but I think I've made a lot of new ones too. And it's been wonderful. Has Joe decided yet to try to teach you how to be an air traffic controller so you can go off and uh, earn a lot of money here in the U S since we have a shortage and supplement his income. Oh my goodness gracious, Michael, I can barely park the car in the garage <laughs> safely, much less land an airplane. So no, I'll, I'll leave that to him. Um, it, it often sounds like a whole different language when, yeah, and, it, it um, and he's at a point where he's doing sort of more a management <clears throat> role of it, but, um, Definitely an air. He's one of those guys you'd be very pleased to know is landing your plane because they say it's a very, very stressful job. And yeah. um, he's very calm about it. And he's the he's the person where if you knew he was on the other end, you go, oh, OK, <laughs> I can keep reading my fiction novel. Yeah, while I'm landing the plane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you yeah. talked about organization. You just gave me a bright idea. You ought to start a, a an online seminar, Organization for Artists. <laughs> oh, gosh. Where would I even begin? I love a good spreadsheet. <laughs> Let me tell you, I love it. <laughs> just, even, just my, uh, it's a goal. even my computer files. I, I, don't, I don't hate this idea, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm about to start, actually, I'm volunteering. I'm teaching a a writing program at the local juvenile correction facility um, Uh all about sort of expressive writing. And um, I've taught all different ages and all different kinds of programs and um, really looking forward to starting this up. So this is where I feel like I'm going to find a way to give back, which always makes my heart sing. So it'll be nice to get back into the community. Good for you. I know that when I, before we moved to California, I still, tr- I'm, I'm sorry, before we moved to the East Coast in 1996, while living in California, I, I traveled to the East a number of times for business. And I was in Midtown Manhattan. It was before they cleaned up a lot of it. Um, and I could go uptown as well. And people said, oh, you don't want to go up there. It's a really bad neighborhood. And what I learned was, yeah, there are weirdos and all that, but mostly if you treat people right and you deal with people appropriately, they're going to respond. And I, I never had a problem going anywhere around New York. Maybe I was just fortunate, but I also really do firmly believe that if you meet people where they need to be, you can, you can bring them on, but they need to know that you really care about them. And if you can show that, then they're going to be all the better for it. And they'll react positively for the most part, don't you think? I 100% agree. And treating people with respect uh, from the from the start, uh, not acting like you're, um, you know, people go through different life circumstances and uh, have different levels of, of power in this world. So I go in meeting everyone where they're at, like you said, and showing them respect. And I think that goes a long way in the world. It does. Yeah. I've been amazed. Well, in the in the the big cities, especially, so many people will come up to me and say, "Does your dog bite?" And you know, I understand where that's coming <laughs> from, but my response is, I wouldn't want to be the person to try to find out. <laughs> and I like that. And they go, "What? What do you mean? What are you talking about?" I said, "He's not trained as a guard dog. He's a guide dog. He's not trained to attack, but." If you have a great relationship like I do with my dog, my dog will very well react if he or she feels that somebody is endangering us. And so I wouldn't want to be the person to try to find out. And I've actually saw an example of that and uh, talked about it, I think, a little bit. We're going to talk about it again in in our new book. But I was on college campus at UC Irvine um, at the time I was there, there weren't very many students, about 2,700. 
But several would bring their dogs to the campus and they would just let them run loose. And then they'd get mm. them at the end of the day. And a number of them decided to oh. go travel around in a pack. And they were coming after us one day. And I had this mild mannered golden retriever for a guide dog who wouldn't wouldn't take offense at anyone. These dogs started getting close and they started growling and barking. He jerked away from me. I still had the leash, but he jerked. So I had ended up losing the harness handle. He spun around, hunkered down as it was described to me by somebody who saw it. And he just started growling at them. He completely intimidated this pack of dogs. Mm. I've never seen before or since any of my dogs do that. But that told me that if they feel in danger, no matter what the dog, they will react. And in my case, if I have a good relationship with my dog, then that feel of endangerment will definitely um, spread to me as well. And I think that that he was protecting both of us. So I wouldn't want to be the person to find out or try to well, find and- out. Last time you and I chatted, I watched Alamo climb up into your lap. So I yeah. think there's a good enough relationship where he would protect you. <laughs> yeah. But he'd rather be in my lap. <laughs> well, you know, don't they all? Mine's the exact same. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so how do you deal with dark times? I mean, you've had several challenges. How do you deal with that? Uh, I I always deal with it with therapy. Always. Um I have a lot of support through my therapist. I surround myself with people who are uh, in my corner, but also honest with me. You know, sometimes um, it's people who can who can stand by you in moments of darkness are pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I write about it and I talk about it openly. You know, you mentioned earlier, there's this inclination to not talk about when we're struggling emotionally. And I think that's very much a cultural thing. And it's definitely something that's carried over from the military. You know, disability is looked at as bad. It is bad and you will lose your job. And that's how we view it. And we revere people who are injured in the forces. You know, they get, they get in the Canadian military, you get stripes on your uniform uh, if you're injured in combat and that kind of thing. And And there's like tiers of disability that are respected and mental health was not one of them. And that's really changed in a wonderful way. And it only changes when we talk about it. So I'm always really open about it. I give a lot of lectures and public talks about struggling with mental health, um, learning to not find shame in it. I read a lot of other people's stories to see that I'm not alone. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm always turning to words somehow <laughs> to find solace. But I think that you must be pretty good at it. So far, it's so going that's okay. So, that's okay. so far, yeah. But you've you've said that writing about being a person with a disability is is really hard. Uh, less so writing about it, but but it, actually, the first book writing about it was really hard because it came with this strange sense of shame. Mm. Um, you know, in the military where it was very, you know, this was the height of Afghanistan war and we were, everyone was deploying and I wasn't because my leg was constantly being operated on. It's weird to be shameful about a part of your body or your mind that isn't working quite up to par. So I felt, yeah, I felt weird shame and I was embarrassed to write about it because I, I call it the misery Olympics. It's like, well, I don't have it as bad as this person and this person and this person, which of course is a ridiculous way just because uh, someone else is in pain doesn't mean I'm not to. Right. So um, I stopped doing that. I stopped doing the comparison. And there's been a lot of freedom that's come from that. And the more you write about it, as it comes up, probably the, I won't say easier, but the less painful it is to write about it. Absolutely. Especially because then people send, I'm sure you get them too, the lovely emails from people who say, oh, thanks for writing about this, or thanks for being honest about this. And uh, I I was at a writer's festival in uh, Vancouver, and a lady had asked me a very similar question, sort of, how do you write about these dark things? And, And I said, well, I go to therapy and I take my medication. And then someone else raised their hand and said, I'm on medication too. And it was like a movie, a slow raising of arms of people saying, <laughs> yeah, me too. And and the lady said to me afterwards, you know, we never, 
why don't we ever say that? Like it's something shameful, you know, yeah. taking a Tylenol for physical pain is not something we look at um, with any why sort we, of disdain. Yeah. Why do we consider talking about disabilities or, or, and then of course mental health is even worse, but a dark thing. That's, that's part of the issue is that we, we still regard anyone with a so-called disability as less and and yes. they're not as good as we are and i would never want to become like that person um of course i i love and i've done more of it lately to talk about disability saying that every single person on the planet has a disability and the problem for most of all y'all as they say down south is mm -hmm. that you're light dependent you know you need light in order to function <laughs> thomas edison made the electric light bulb so that you have a way of covering up that disability and we've done so much to make sure that you have light whenever and wherever you need it but suddenly the power goes out and you don't have a smartphone or a flashlight right in front of you you're in a world of hurt don't mm -hmm. tell me that isn't just as much a disability as being if you will light independent uh, the only thing is that there are a whole lot less of us than they don't tend to do as much with the technology, although we're getting better at it, but we've got a long way to go. But, you know, we've got to get away from this whole idea that's that it's dark and someone who is different than us is less than us. But I guess a lot of people would say, well, that's just human nature. And, and I believe that we don't need to say that it isn't human nature. It's what we're taught, but it's not human nature. And I also think you know, I, a lot of people assume that I um, regret my military service because it's left, left me with a disability. Um, and I also have rheumatoid arthritis now, which, of course, mm. really, uh, makes a lot of these things a lot more complex. Oh, you just have um, that so the joke can carry you around more. Oh, it's all part of my plan. My yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Joe, but you're not listening, are you? <laughs> <laughs> my wife had our, outside. My, my wife had RA starting in 2017, so I'm familiar uh. with it. Yeah, it's quite the uh, quite the adventure. And um, I often get a lot of people who look at me and think, but you're fine. And, and while I am fine, and this is yeah. the thing too, in a lot of ways, I am fine. And in a lot of ways, my disability has become a superpower in terms of creating such a deeper sense of compassion and empathy for other people in all walks of life and and different experiences that uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And that's the real issue, isn't it? Yeah. So we've talked about a lot today. Um, what inspired you? Mm. Everyday people. You know, I think we often reveal, revere people in big positions of power or people who are in the news who are doing really great things. I admire the single mom who's waking up every day and making breakfast for her kids and working two jobs. I admire the um, person who gets up despite crushing depression and somehow gets out of bed and makes their cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. So I'm really inspired by those everyday things. I'm really inspired by my marriage. Um, I think Joe and I are people who work really hard at our marriage, even though it feels that kind of working hard also feels easy yeah. because we care about each other. But um, I, I sometimes feels like a bad feminist to say <laughs> that, <laughs> that my marriage feels like one of my greatest accomplishments, but it does because we work really hard at it. And, and he's wonderful to this day. And marriage is something that you should work at. Isn't it? Absolutely. We Absolutely. we did it for 40 years. We had good times, bad times, and everything in between, but I wouldn't trade any single memory out of any of that for anything because 100%. it was all part of, of what, who we were and what we were together. And I've got those 40 years of memories, and they sometimes come up at the most unexpected times, which is great. Mm -hmm. I love it. And, and that will always be the way it is. Yes, exactly. So I'll keep cherishing my marriage in honor of you yours. You do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, one of these days we'll have to meet Joe. Oh, I tell you, if I do a book club, they don't give a hoot about me, Michael. They want to meet Joe. <laughs> they course. always want to meet Joe. And uh, Well, and I know I the feeling. Everybody always wants to meet the dog. I don't count, right? <laughs> If you really want a complex, when you go, when I go to guide dogs for the blind, 
or any student goes back to guide dogs for the blind, they all know the dog's names and they don't know the students' names. <laughs> Would give you a bit of a complex. Oh, that almost made me cry and laugh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they know the dogs. They don't know us. So, you know. Uh, so I know my place in the world. And then the other the other part about it is we have a cat and yes. the cat runs the house, right? There's no question about it. When the cat wants to eat, our cat yells at me until I come and pet her while she's eating. She wants to get back rubs while she eats and she won't eat until I come in and she gets very offended if I don't. And she'll come seek me out if she has to, but it's, you know, so it's nice to know where you are in the scheme of the, of the, the food chain. Yeah. Well, and I'm going to start making these kinds of demands. There you go. Someone's got to come bring, bring a, bring a back scratcher to me while I eat dinner every day. <laughs> Try that and see how well it works. <laughs> I'll report back. <laughs> yeah. Let me know. <laughs> well, I want to really thank you for being on with us today. This has been absolutely a lot of fun. Thanks I've enjoyed you. it. You're getting close to five o'clock and dinner time or, you know, or, or you can always have one of those libations, you know, I suppose, but uh, at least it's getting close to dinner time. I'm fully admitting that Joe even brought me a cocktail tiptoed in here while I was uh, on our chat and brought well, me a cocktail. Well, my gosh, where the heck is he? I know. Um, I'll keep him. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, no, no, we'll have to do a podcast interview with Joe. That'd be cool. You know, I love to say it and I say it probably way too often on this podcast. I feel sorry for people who don't drink because when they get up in the morning, that's as good as they're going to feel for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much Dean Martin for me, but anyway. I think we'd get along just fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I am going to get to Colorado again at some point soon because I'm on a board there. So when I gonna, I'm going to be there, I'll let you know. We'll have to get together. I will be there with the red carpet. Well, for you, thank you. and the dog. I, well, or for the dog <laughs> and me. I you know, I know how it goes. <laughs> Michael, you're just a gift. This has been fun, and I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank and you. any last things you'd like to say to people? Um, to be kind. Above all else, to be kind. Being kind, being empathetic and compassionate doesn't have to be um, a strike against you. It can yeah. be a beautiful thing. Yeah. We don't need to have meanness. Oh, we just don't. There's enough of that in the world without actively seeking it. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Well, thank you again. This has been fun. I hope all of you out there listening have enjoyed this. Um, I know we have. We've laughed and we've had fun. I hope you have laughed as well. Love to hear from you about our episode today. Um, but first, before I give you my contact information, Kelly, if people want to reach out to you and uh, and maybe communicate in any way, how might they do that? My website is Kelly S. Thompson, as in Sarah Thompson, uh, <laughs> dot com. And I'm on Twitter at Kelly S underscore Thompson and Instagram at Kelly S Thompson writer. There you it's go. Mostly photos of my dog though. Let's be honest. Yeah, I know. It's always <laughs> the way it works. Well, and that's why I don't use Instagram very much because it's usually all photos. So I don't get much out of Instagram. <laughs> that's true. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again. And I thank hope you. all of you have really liked this and, and you will please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can email me at Michael H I at accessibe, A C C E S S I B E dot com, or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson.com and Michael Hingson's M I C H A E L H I N G S O N dot com slash podcast. Love to hear your thoughts. Um, wherever you're listening, please give us a five star rating. We appreciate that. We appreciate and value all those ratings, especially the five-star ones, of course, but we want to know what you think and whatever it may be. And whatever you do, if you know anyone else who ought to be a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, please let us know. Reach out to me, um, provide an introduction. We really do appreciate it a great deal. And again, Kelly, once last time, this has been absolutely fun. And I want to thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> 